What's up, everybody? Tori McElhaney, Taryn Walk, joined here by Albert Brewer of SI. We are back on Radio Row for the second day at the NFL Scouting Combine. Albert, we are really curious just to start off. What did you think about the Falcons going out, bringing Raheem Morris back into the building, someone that the organization knows very, very well? What did you yeah. kind of think of that hire? I mean, it was interesting because, you know, the Bill Belichick thing was hanging out there right. for a while. And, um, you know, I, I think after they worked through that, and obviously I think for a number of different reasons that didn't work out, um, Raheem made all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you've been around Raheem, you understand the sort of person he is, the sort of energy he can bring. He's a dynamite football coach. He's coached on both sides of the ball. He's coached multiple systems on defense. He um, was as close to Sean McVay and as important to Sean McVay as maybe anybody who's gone through that Rams staff you know, over the last seven years, won a championship there. And what's really rare about Raheem is – You'd be hard-pressed to find a guy who has been a head coach before and had 13 years mm -hmm. to consider everything, to go through everything, to examine everything, and to come back on the other side of it. So, you know, he did have the three years of experience as a head coach in Tampa, and now you've got, 13, I guess it was 12 seasons, mm -hmm. right, but 13 years in separation from that. It's given him a lot of time to sort of, you know, grow up and reimagine himself and, 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 and take a, a critical eye to, to, to his own job performance and working for people like, you know, obviously Mike Shanahan in, right. in, in, in Washington and, um, you know, D, DQ um, mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta and, you know, Jay Gruden in yeah. Washington and, and most recently Sean McVay in, in L.A. He's gotten to see it done a lot of different ways. So um, I think Raheem was one of the best. I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting with you guys. I think right, Raheem yeah. was one of the best hires of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the draft this season, where would you put the Falcons in their needs for number eight? I mean, I think the need is obvious, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yep. Yeah. Offensive lineman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't think that there's any mis mistaking what they need. And um, you know, I think even Arthur Smith would probably tell you, like, if he has one regret, it was probably not being more aggressive at quarterback. And there was logic behind it. And I don't totally disagree with what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith did the last three years, which is trying to be patient at the quarterback position. The problem is, you know, you build your team up, and now you got a team that's ready to win. And, and that position yeah. is so important that it can really undermine things if you're not strong there. So, um, you know, the good news for the Falcons is they – I do think, you know – um, Terry and his staff have built the roster up to a point where, um, you know, with a really solid offensive line and veterans like Jake Matthews and Chris Lindstrom and mm -hmm. young skill players like B. John Robinson and um, and, and and Drake, Drake London, London and, yeah. and, and Kyle, Kyle Pitts. Pitts. And then on defense, you know, with <laughs> cornerstones, I mean, older like Grady Jarrett and younger like <laughs> yeah, A.J. Yeah. Terrell, there's, there's a good base of talent where you're not going to have to overreach. Um, for any position and you don't need volume of picks so mm -hmm. they will have the ability to move picks for a veteran quarterback if they want to or move picks to go up in the draft to go and take one when you're kind of evaluating what this quarterback class looks like if the falcons were to go the route of drafting a quarterback in the first round and potentially moving <laughs> up how much do you what, is there a name that you really are drawn to in this quarterback class i mean so i think the way you want to look at it is there's i think there's two buckets right and so i think the first bucket is you know the elite group which is you know, obviously the top caleb williams and right. then yeah. depending on how you see them drake may and and Jaden daniels one two three um and I, I think those quarterbacks in all likelihood will go one two three and that's not to say the bears commanders patriots are definitely sticking and taking one but i think the value of those picks because there is a drop off after those three mm -hmm. will be really high so if the Commanders or Patriots, I think the Bears will stick and take one at one. But if the Commanders or Patriots decided maybe we should move, there's going to be great value and more value in moving those picks than there probably would be in sticking and taking a position player. So I think the, that you have that first group with, with Williams, Daniels, and May. And then I think you have this next group where, you know, you're just you got to be comfortable with some flaw there, right? right? So yeah. it's J.J. McCarthy from Michigan. It's Bo Nix from Oregon. It's Michael Penix from Washington. Depending on how, how you see him, maybe Spencer Rattler from South Carolina. And so that puts the Falcons in an interesting spot because you look at it if you're them and you say, okay, can we get in the top three? Mm -hmm. 
and if we can't get in the top three, would we yeah. rather go all in on one of the second tier guys, say it's JJ, right? right. So you go all in on JJ McCarthy, knowing, all right, well, that's it for us now. That's our guy going forward. Or do you, you know, get a little creative and, you know, make a trade for uh, Justin Fields or sign a Russell Wilson or a Kirk Cousins where if you take one of those guys, then if you wind up with one of those guys, well, now you're not handcuffed. Yeah. Now you can still draft one at eight if you want to. You can still, um, you can still um, you know, build going forward and take one in 25 or 26 buys you some time. So um, there's different ways they can attack yeah. this. But, I mean, I think Raheem said it himself, right, that they're going to be aggressive. Right. If you're kind of – thinking about it when you're thinking about an aggressive mindset are you kind of leaning more towards that aggression showing up for a quarterback in free agency trade or the draft if you're the Falcons at this point I, again I think so much of it depends on like it, and look like I'm not an evaluator right, but I right. do know I do know like the a lot of teams view their being a relative now there are some that don't but like I'd say most teams think there's a relatively significant drop off after yeah. the top three so so if you're going to be aggressive, you got to get yeah, I think it's getting into be the top up. three. Yeah. And really, like, the problem with that is you don't have control over it. Like, so yeah. if Washington really likes Daniels or May, and then New England likes both of them, mm -hmm. then those teams probably aren't moving. So now I think you have to weigh the whole thing and say, okay, do we like J.J. McCarthy that much? Do we like Bo Nix that much where we're willing to take him at eight? Um, if we aren't, you know, which of the veteran quarterbacks makes sense. It's it's a little complicated just because you don't have control over that first option, mm -hmm. which could be to go up and get one. And so um, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of like the control in this year's draft belongs to those teams. Right. Tip picking in the top three. And, you know, that's something the Falcons and some other teams, too, in the top half of the first round that have quarterback needs are going to have to work around. Mm hmm if you're not going quarterback, who are you going for at number eight? I mean, the, the, the nice thing is, like, this is a really, really strong draft at the top. Mm -hmm. Like, this, I, like, a lot of people I've talked to, you know, because of the effect that NIL and the transfer portal and all these things have had in college football, um, there were less underclassmen that declared. I think the number was 58, which I... I, I believe that was like 144 mm, that does um, seem really, in 2019. Really low. Yeah, so 58 was the number this yeah. year. So the effect that's had on the classes, there's a big drop off after the fourth round. Mm -hmm. And like there's not as much depth, but the top of the draft is really good. So you want to take advantage of having a pick in that range. And so like if you need if if you want another receiver, that's going to be there for you. Yeah. Now, I can't tell you which one's going to fall. Marvin Harrison probably won't make it there, but maybe Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors make it there. The tackle spot, and that's one that's been a strong one for the Falcons for a while, so maybe that'd be less of a consideration, but there are a ton of tackles. Joe Alt from Notre Dame, Olu Fashanu from Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a couple pass rushers, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that could be something the Falcons could really look at, right. like a Dallas Turner from Alabama, Jared Verse from Florida State. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the beauty of this year's draft class is like how the, the top half of the first round, you have top end prospects who you're not forcing it by taking them there and they play premium positions. And so that's why, I, you know, again, like if you're not in love with J.J. McCarthy or Bo Nix or Michael Penix, you can't get up into the top three. There will be good options there. Regardless of how they go, if they get the quarterback position right, how much does that change the way that maybe nationally people look at the Falcons organization and what the product that they could put on the field in 24? Well, I mean, I think there's – anytime there's a new coach, there's going to be some curiosity. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some curiosity over where they are under Raheem Morris. And, you know, I think people will look at them like this is sort of a new operation, even though some of the pieces are still in place. Yeah. Rich McKay is still there. Terry Fontenot is still there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think it is a team that looks like you can – it looks like it's about ready. If you if you plug a quarterback in there, um, the job that they've done developing people through the system, the lack of holes they have, some of the high-profile signings they made last year, Jesse Bates obviously was yeah. a big one. Um, they have a core where you could say, I mean, I thought they were going to win the division last year, and I probably was guilty of not putting enough stock into how – sketchy the quarterback situation sketchy. was sketchy. but uh, sketchy is probably the wrong word <laughs> no, i love that word yeah. stick with it <laughs> uh, i'm showing my age with that <laughs> word. um they had a uh, no but i i like i i 
I, it does feel like to some degree they're a quarterback away and that they are right there. And so um, I do think like and, and, and like to me, like that's sort of the appeal too of maybe do you look at Kirk Cousins? Right. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like because it's regardless of who the rookie is, he's probably going to need some time. Yeah. And, you know, like, yeah, you can lean on Bijan and Tyler Algier in the running game, but, you know, like it probably will take a little time to get the guy up and running. Whereas if you plug Kirk Cousins in there, are you the favorite in the South right away? Maybe. You know what I mean? Like, and in an NFC that I don't think is, like, tremendously deep with teams that are at the top of the top of the food chain, you know, I, I mean, Philly took a step back. Dallas will see. San Francisco, I think, will be, but has some cap issues. Mm-hmm. The Rams should be really strong coming back off of what was a reset year for them. Um, I think you have a chance to contend. So like, that's, like, what to me would be enticing about the idea of going and getting a Kirk Cousins is that, I think a lot of other pieces of that roster are ready to win right now. Especially when Arthur Smith is on, not Smith, Arthur Blank is on the record. <laughs> Both Arthurs. <laughs> Arthur Blank, the owner, is on the record saying he wants to win immediately. Like, that is the priority. Yeah. Well, I would think that that would, you know, it's interesting. When the rumors started with, and like, I was hearing some of that stuff on Belichick with, like, a couple yeah. weeks left in the season. And a big part of it was, like, that Arthur didn't want to, didn't want to gamble anymore and didn't want to take a chance anymore. Yeah. And if you look at, like, a lot of the – you get his hires historically. I mean, you go back, like, Jim Moore was a young assistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bobby Petrino was coming from college. Mike Smith wasn't young, but he was a career assistant. Um, you know, Dan Quinn, yeah. same thing. Yeah. You know, a, a, a rising young assistant. Arthur Smith, same category. Like, he's projected a lot into that role, which was part of the Bill Belichick thing, was, like, he's getting older – you don't want to guess anymore. Mm-hmm. You want some certainty. And I think Raheem brings you that, too, because he's been a head coach before. Yeah. Wasn't he the first, like, head coach rehire? Of Arthur Blank? Yes. Yeah. 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 So this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so no very problem. much for chatting with us. I, I feel like I've learned a lot just from talking to you, <laughs> so I really appreciate you dropping by. No problem. We're now joined by Charles Davis of the NFL Network. Charles, overall, what are just your initial impressions about what the Falcons could do going into the 2024 offseason? Boy, they could do a, they could do a bunch of things, a lot. couldn't they? Yeah. But it's an interesting thing when we say a lot, because typically when we say a lot, that means that's a franchise that's not doing very well. That yeah. means it's a franchise that doesn't have a lot of hope, you know? I look at New England, and it's hard to believe they've got the number three pick overall. And it's hard to believe that. I would espouse that whatever pick they make, take the best player available. Mm -hmm. Don't pick for need because you're not trying to supplement a playoff team. Right, right. I propose a massive rebuild. Here it's different. Right. This is a team that's in the mix for a division championship. This is a team that that has some exciting pieces already in place. So guess what? We're back to quarterback, aren't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just no getting around it. As much (laughs) as we want to go, well, let's talk about other positions, and we will. Mm -hmm. But we're back to quarterback. And sitting there, what are you at, number eight pick Mm -hmm. overall? Mm -hmm. That seems to be a familiar number, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Weird. (laughs) Third time in the last three years. (laughs) Third time's a charm. (laughs) What happens at that number? Mm -hmm. Because I think there's going to be two waves of quarterbacks. I really do. It would not surprise me. The top three we know mm-hmm. is Caleb Williams out of USC, is Jade Daniels out of LSU, is Drake May out of North Carolina, or is it Drake May two, mm-hmm. Jade Daniels three? Because I do believe Caleb Williams is, is one, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Now we move on. Now, here's our next thing. J.J. McCarthy, Michigan, how do you feel about him? Some people really have a high grade on him. Other people, eh, right. and I'm not saying that they're skeptical, but maybe not as high as others. So he might go into the mix with, Bo Nix at Oregon, Mm -hmm. Michael Penix out of Washington. Is that where we're going? Mm -hmm. Will we have that second wave that those quarterbacks get drafted? And by the way, that second wave is where Atlanta sits, Mm -hmm. unless Atlanta makes it, unless Terry Fontenot and crew are willing to make that kind of a move to go up because they have conviction, I want one of those guys. We'll see how that part plays out. But quarterback's a big deal. And as you guys well know, heck, it might not be the quarterback at eight because you might have a veteran in place. (laughs) You know? so That's always an option, too. That's always an option, too. And we'll see what happens from there. But we've said it for the last couple of years, and I still stand by it. The NFC South is probably – it's funny. AFC South's volatile, too. It's Mm. a volatile division that pretty much anyone can win. Mm -hmm. And if things fall into place, there you are. The funny part is Tampa Bay's like, you guys keep saying that and we keep winning. It. Yeah. <laughs> That's the true. weird part, right? Yeah. Everybody says it's open, mm-hmm. but we keep winning it with and without Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. Right. So there you go. Yeah. 
when you're in the position of power, would you go for a draft or would you go with free agency or trade to get a veteran? Do you want a rookie or a veteran in power of this offense that that's already great. has potential? <laughs> Taryn, that's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. I tried. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm putting it, you in the power here. I, I like it. I like it. Terry's like, no, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm in the power. All right? <laughs> Here's the deal. Where I am in my evaluations right now is not where I'm going to be in a month from now. Okay, so take that part with a grain of salt. But what I would say is if Terry Fontenot and crew have that conviction that at eight, this is a quarterback we really, really like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to get him. Mm -hmm. Because the way the rules read now, the way contracts read now, remember we always used to say it was a huge mistake if you missed on a quarterback. It would set your franchise back and all that. It's not the same. It's not the same because – the, the collective bargaining agreement, the bonuses paid, all that. Mm-hmm. If it were the same, the Cardinals, <laughs> yeah. They remember, when they drafted Josh Rosen, they moved up mm-hmm. to 10 mm-hmm. to take Josh Rosen. They gave away capital. And then after one year, they came back and took Kyler Murray at one. You don't have to sit there. If that's not your guy, you don't have to sit there and live with it anymore. Right. So if I have conviction that's the guy that I want, I'm going to go get him because I like to start young and build. Mm-hmm. You might want to parlay it and double down, Taryn, and get a veteran and draft the guy at eight anyway. And develop the rookie. Mm -hmm. This, this, you know, look, I've said it for years, and I still stand with it. I'm not shying away from it. If I'm drafting a quarterback in the top ten, he's playing. It's almost irresistible to me. I didn't draft him to sit him. And everyone is saying right now, well, the best stories have been the guys who have sat. Mahomes sat. Jordan Love sat. And you can point to all of that. Matt Ryan didn't sit. Mm-mm. Would you call him a bad quarterback? Absolutely no. not. Okay. So I'm just saying, if you got the right guy, he can do it. Yeah. If you build around him. And Thomas Dimitrov was the GM at that time. Mm-hmm. You guys might remember, or if not, you've heard, in that draft, they took Matt Ryan at three instead of Glenn Dorsey's defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. They, they signed Michael the Burner Turner as a free agent tailback. They drafted Jake Matthews. Uh, not Jake Matthews, but um, a Baker. Yep. They drafted Sam Baker at left yep. tackle. Right? Mm. They built. They worked. Oh, by the way, you went 11-5 and five that year, went to the playoffs with a rookie quarterback. Right, yeah. So it can be done, mm-hmm. but you have to have that conviction as an organization to do it. I'm starting to like that double down thing, Karen. I'm starting, <laughs> I'm starting to then. like. I'm starting to like it. I feel like Herb Brooks in the movie Miracle. What's that give us, boys? <laughs> options. <laughs> so for you, if you if you go the double down route, what pairing of veteran rookie quarterback? Can I get Kirk Cousins here? You can, know, can I get him here? In this You're in power. Can I do You're it? You're in power. Can I get him here? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm bringing in Kirk Cousins. Okay. <laughs> He adapts to organizations. He adapts to teammates. Teammates adapt to him. He's one of the best people you ever meet. Your locker room will be fine right out of the gate. And he is that giver. So the vet, the second guy behind him is not sitting there all year long, Kirk going, hey, let me tell you this how it's going to work. <laughs> I'm on a quarterback. You can watch me pick up whatever you want to pick up. If you got to, you know, yeah, I might answer, I might not. Mm-hmm. All right? But. No, Kirk's going to be like, this is what I do. This is how I do it. This is my process. Mm-hmm. This is how I study. This is what you, you need some extra help? Mentor. Come on over. You know, my wife will cook us dinner, and we'll do all these <laughs> things. He is that person. He's very giving of himself because he's also very confident yeah. in his own abilities. Nothing wrong with that. No. But he'd be the perfect mentor model out of the quarterbacks that are out there. If you want to go Justin Fields, I'm not doubling down. Oh, I'm not doubling down because I'm bringing in Justin Fields to be my guy. Now i got to build my team around yeah. what he does okay. best. If I'm bringing in Russell Wilson, I'm probably doubling down because yep. he's closer to the end than he is in the beginning. So that's how I'm okay. looking at the veteran yeah. guys. Like Do you it. think the rookies are, – are there are any rookies that you would want more in the double-down situation than others? Ooh, that's – what the heck? <laughs> Why are you doing asking all these good <laughs> questions like that? Look, I, I think that I think that Penix, Bo Nix – even J.J. McCarthy would all benefit big time to be able to do that, to be able to sit there. Because they're very used to taking good coaching and they're used to looking up at someone and having it. Look, Penix was a starter from day one. Mm-hmm. Bo Nix was a starter from day one. But they were raised in different things. Mm-hmm. Fathers were coaches. So they yep. understand yeah. that chain of authority, that chain of command, even though they never had to do it that way because they were always that guy. Yeah. But they've also been through their bumps and their shares. Penix with injuries, transfer from Indiana to, to Washington. Mm-hmm. Bo Nix, expectations yeah. at his father's school. Yeah. 
And then he got found his reward at another school. Now he's the academic Heisman winner. Mm-hmm. So I think that they fit really well. And by the way, J.J. McCoy played for, for Jim Harbaugh. Mm-hmm. He's going to understand authority right. and, and, and respecting that and doing it the right way. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, now you can go get a real guest, all right? I'll talk to you guys <laughs> oh later. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're now joined by Jordan Rodriguez of The Athletic. Now, you are someone who knows our staff in Atlanta. Better than we do. Honestly, (laughs) to a certain extent, outside of Raheem, you probably know these guys a lot better than we do. I'm very curious what's kind of been the vibe in the Rams office about the departure of, of these guys that I think meant a lot to that organization. Yeah. Mass departure, first right. of all. So Sean McVay made a joke with, with me last week where he was like, yeah, Raheem, you know, great for him. And, and opined about his friend, his, one of his best friends in life and a coach he really respects and admires, wanted to get this job. Yeah. And then sort of added in the little, yeah, he took like all of our staff. <laughs> but the thing about this was is there's always a plan. Mm-hmm. And Sean McVay is used to losing these coaches, right? Yeah, yeah. This happens Part yearly for, the course. for him. Yeah. Raheem was someone who was due, mm-hmm. and Sean was was talking, you know, all year about how he deserved a job. The Rams front office was talking about how much he deserved this job and, and, and a head coaching job. Yeah. And so there's always a plan. When you present your list of, of potential staffers to owners, mm-hmm. the team you're on sees it too. Yeah, they know maybe. how you're supposed to develop a contingency for that. So there was a plan. Mm-hmm. However, that does not understate the significance of losing people like Zach Robinson. Mm-hmm. KJ Black was really a rising star. Nick Jones, yeah. Matthew Stafford's former center, was actually <laughs> coaching Matthew Stafford's current center. <laughs> That's wild. You know, so I didn't it, realize that. And John Griffin, the, yeah. the assistant strength coach. I mean, you know, those are those are big losses yeah. that the Rams will have to figure out, as they always have to do, mm-hmm. figure out how to plan for that and how to. And, and Sean McVay had people ready to rehire and all of those things. But the significance of that, you know, I heard from a, a source in the building that said, I don't know how, though, we're going to replace the energy that Raheem Morris brought every single day. And yeah. I think that's significant. Yeah. That's something that they will have to figure out. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite Raheem Morris story? Because I know everybody always does. Everybody always is like, this is a person who comes into a room and you know he's in the room. Yeah. So is, is there a moment over the years that you've been covering him that you, you really appreciate who yeah. Raheem Morris is and the energy that he does bring. This will be overly earnest, mm-hmm. so apologies to <laughs> no, audience. No, no, never, never apologize. You mentioned he, you you know he's in every room that yeah. he's in. Mm-hmm. He also lets you know you are seen in mm-hmm. every room that he's in. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a really great teacher over the years that I got to cover him, and he was super open about his information, how he saw defenses, how he saw offenses. Yeah. He always took extra time to make sure that you knew that, as any media member, that you knew that um, if you had extra context, if you needed extra context, if you were curious and wanted to learn and wanted to understand not just scheme or, or uh, coaching dynamics, but also interpersonal dynamics within the coaching staff and in the front office and in the scouting department and in the locker room. He was always there to support you in that Yeah. Um, because he understands that, that openness and um, that sort of extra context and, and people on the outside understanding what the work is on the inside. Mm-hmm. That matters. That helps build culture from the inside out. Mm. That's amazing to hear as someone who is now going to do like, so on a regular basis. <laughs> Get a story list going. <laughs> We're yeah. like, okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> what gives you confidence in Zach Robinson specifically in the role he currently has? Yeah, so Zach, I don't think a lot of people know this about Zach, but when Baker Mayfield came in and got there on a Tuesday and won a game on a Thursday, mm-hmm. um, Zach Robinson was really such a significant person in onboarding him. Interesting. So what I learned from that, because Zach has always been um, – talk about other people first guy. Very, very smart person. You guys know this. You yep. talk to him. Um, very ready, I think, for this opportunity and to grow into this opportunity that he'll be having for the first time. And there will be a learning curve, obviously. Mm-hmm. But from that, that was the, some of the craziest, those were some of the craziest couple of days that I think I've ever covered because it was so outlandish, the whole thing. <laughs> but all through that, and I, I spoke with Baker um, after that win, and he showed me his notebook and all of his notes that he and Zach were translating really complicated schematic concepts into Mm -hmm. simple communication, understanding what your role is, understanding what you have to know, throwing out what you don't have to Mm -hmm. know. And and really, I think what Sean McVay always says is, 
really great coaches and really great leaders in any profession can take the complex and communicate it into something democratically understandable. Mm -hmm. Like everybody can understand what you're saying and knows what they have to do, right. to, no matter how complicated or complex it is. You really saw that happen in such a short amount of time with Baker. And I think if you ask Baker to this day, he will still gush about what a help Zach Robinson was for him. But, but Zach also did that when Carson Wentz came in. I was about to say, Zach yeah. Also, you yeah. know, Sean McVay works with Matthew Stafford. Mm -hmm. And Zach Robinson worked with Matthew Stafford. But Sean McVay and the quarterback, Sean McVay is an offensive head coach. Right. And so Zach Robinson really, when there was um, any sort of question about someone who was going to potentially mm -hmm. have to start a game or a couple of games um, in terms of those veteran quarterbacks who sort of have landed with the Rams yeah. in the last couple of years, years um, Zach really took a leadership role in that and I think that was something that the coaching staff really championed him for internally yeah that's you bring up such a good point because that was something that I talked to Zach Robinson about when he first got in here is about all the different quarterbacks that he had the chance to work with in a very short amount of time mm -hmm. what do you think that experience could teach someone like Zach Robinson as he goes into a situation with the Falcons where there are a lot of unknowns at the yeah. quarterback position? Well, I think you have to learn yourself. You have to learn who you're going to be as a play caller, as a coordinator, as a teacher. Those are the three key things that he's going to have to continue developing in order to hit the learning curve of what this role will be. Mm -hmm. But I think I mean, the Ram <laughs> it's not a secret <laughs> that the Rams have <laughs> rolled through their backups a lot, a lot. over the last couple right. of years, right? Had to. Yeah, Had no choice. not a secret. And, yeah. and then obviously Matthew Stafford played at an elite level and, and has since, you know, his whole career, but yeah. especially last year, really, I think, blew the doors off of some of the, the people that were sort of maybe, is he, is he about ready to On go? Like, all that yeah. And I think um, seeing such a range of outcomes mm -hmm. and possibilities, but continuing to keep the process you know, the same and, and focusing on fundamentals and teaching and coaching. That's that's a core trait I think Zach will bring with him. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is he's he's had the data, right? Yeah. He's experienced the data. Mm -hmm. Now it's about disseminating the, the data into his own personal process and really putting his own fingerprints on who he is going to be. Um, as you guys know, when you're working under an offensive coach, mm -hmm. It's hard to develop your own personality right. yeah. a lot. And find your lane. Yeah, yeah. And, fi and find where your gifts are. Yeah. And so I think where um, I think Sean should get some credit for letting Zach call preseason games, things mm -hmm. like that, because those were opportunities to try to yeah. funnel that data into something tangible. Mm -hmm. And this job will be Zach's opportunity to start maybe sorting and funneling all of that life data that he has mm -hmm. now into something tangible and really figuring out who he wants to be. And obviously, that's someone that Raheem Morris believed in. That's someone Sean McVay really believed in yeah. and, and hated to lose, obviously. Mm -hmm. But that he is someone who um, I think will attack that process with a lot of enthusiasm. Something that Raheem talked a lot about in his introductory press conference, and Taryn actually wrote a story about this, is about the relationship between Sean McVay and Les Snead. And he said that he was jealous of that relationship. And really, he was like, I knew when I became a head coach, when that time came for me, that that's the relationship I wanted to have with a head coach GM dynamic. What are elements of their relationship <laughs> that you think can translate to Raheem and Terry Fontenot now mm -hmm. in Atlanta? And, and what kind of are those that you see? Yeah, well, Sean and Les, um, it's very real yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's and I laugh because you you know you see th if you're a beat writer you see people and how they interact with each other and but I've seen them really grow into each other mm -hmm. they started out and they were winning so fast and Sean was the wonderkind head coach right. and all mm -hmm. of that yeah. and after uh, the first loss the first Super Bowl that they lost um, you know I really saw them uh, they got really real with each other mm, yeah. and there were really no walls or withheld opinions and it's not like there were before but everything was moving so fast sometimes yeah. you just don't cover certain topics or yeah. you just don't know what it's like to work through adversity yet yeah. things and are going so good yeah. there's no reason to change yeah, anything yeah and Sean was like 32 and it's like <laughs> yeah. how do you talk to someone who's like 20 years older than you <laughs> I'm just kidding about that but it's like you know it, it's it's you know they got they, there are no walls with those two yeah and it's so fun to hear them interact you've seen I think some of the viral clips of them yes, yeah. having a good time with each other mm -hmm. but uh, it's it's really it is fun to watch them interact because they do they trust each mm -hmm. other and that comes from the fact that there are no uh, there are arguments mm -hmm. there are dis disagreements but there are no bad days because you're always talking and communicating and there are no 
there's um it's all very real and it's yeah. honest and they really truly care about each other that comes with working through some adversity that comes with building that comes from being so interconnected in the team building building process as they have been over the years and also that comes from i think less as a an older uh person who's experienced I'm not calling him old, Les, right? But yeah. very an experienced. Older, he's an seasoned. experienced. He's tenured. <laughs> he's a you know, veteran. He's yeah. a veteran. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he he's experienced life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he understood. You know, Sean and the Rams. They had a hard 2022. They Raheem did. was a crucial part of holding that building together, mm -hmm. in a really hard 2022. Mm -hmm. And Les had a million ideas, <clears throat> and he's told me this. He had a million ideas of how he could swoop in and just. Band-Aid over everything. Yeah. But what, one thing he said to me that was so profound, I'll never forget it, is he's got he's to gotta live the life. He's got to live his life. In his early 30s, we, they kind of took the life experience away because he's winning a bunch of football right. games and yeah. sprinting and, and, like, a head coach, at, you know, so young. And I think the, the, that life experience and, and, like, knowing when to let go and when to hold on and knowing how to interact in a very real human way mm -hmm. – that's culture, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's that's collaboration. And the continuity that this team has had, I mean, it's pretty rare in mm -hmm. the NFL. And they know that that's a privilege and a gift. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they work at it. They work at that relationship because they understand that that continuity is quietly one of the bigger advantages that they 100%. can have over other teams. Yeah, no, this has been a fan fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for all the insight and helping us yeah. kind of shed some light on parts of this coaching staff that you know very well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys.